Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you all for, for coming. This is a great turnout. I'm glad you're all as excited as I am about Sean's talk. So we're pleased to welcome Sean Kane back to Microsoft Research. Uh, Sean right. um, was a local for many years. He got his PhD in the iSchool at the University of Washington. And he also did several internships at Microsoft uh, during his, his graduate career. Mm -hmm. And now he's a faculty member at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County in their human-centered computing program. And his research focuses on accessible technologies, and in particular on accessible mobile technologies and accessible uh, touch-oriented technologies. Uh, and so uh, we're really excited to have Sean uh, present uh, on some of his work uh, while he's here in town to, to work on a joint research project. So I'll let, I'll let mm -hmm. Sean begin. All right. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so as you were introducing me, I flipped for a second to my second slide, which had my, actually, my, my tours of duty at Microsoft. I was an undergrad intern at Microsoft, too, way back in the, in the 70s. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so, uh, so hi. I know many of you. Uh, thanks for coming, one and all. Uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit today about uh, the work I've been doing uh, starting as a PhD student and leading into a role as a faculty and working with students, uh, primarily in the area of uh, accessible interaction and um, primarily beginning with gestures, but looking at ways that we can also just think about how to design uh, what I would consider to be next generation uh, accessible and assistive technologies. So I'm going to tell you about a few projects in that space and uh, show you some stuff <coughs> we've been working on. So uh, Mary gave a great introduction, so I won't spend any time on this one. But um, I wanted to start by just uh, beginning with, a, with uh, some thoughts about the kind of work that we do in accessibility. So I know many of you here are students in an accessibility seminar and thinking about uh, how do we do accessibility research, how do we build accessible technologies. Uh, and uh, two things that, that have come to mind and I've been thinking about in my work for the last few years. So first is that a lot of the work that we do in accessibility tends to be reactive. And so uh, somewhere off in mainstream world, we develop some technology and that, that becomes extremely popular. So look at uh, smartphones or tablets or other kinds of contemporary technologies. Uh, and then we tend to bolt on accessibility te uh, technology uh, as, as a kind of an afterthought or as a reaction. Uh, so this image here is of a uh, key guard. So it takes a QWERTY keyboard and provides a kind of tactile overlay to the, to the keyboard so that the user can actually um, more accurately type. So if someone had, for example, a motor uh, disability or some kind of tremor, then this, kind of, this add-on might actually help them uh, input uh, type on the keyboard. Um, but this is really very much an after-the-fact uh, after add-on to existing technology. Um, the other piece we see is that even when we look at new assistive technology and new technologies, uh, a lot of times this technology isn't designed with uh, the user and their abilities in mind or their, their, mean, their natural means of interaction. So uh, in the past few years, we've seen quite a lot of projects like this. This is a guy with a helmet with a connect on his head. And uh, you know, this is uh, has an, it's an interesting idea, right? And we want to think about how do we leverage sensing technologies and when we think about new, again, mainstream technologies and leverage them for accessibility. But we want to do that in a way that is in accordance with uh, what people are naturally doing and what people are, are naturally good at doing. Uh, and so uh, I want to talk about a few projects today I've been working on for the past several years uh, and looking at it. Just a few key themes in this work. So the first is really leveraging this idea of natural interaction to make assistive technology easier to use. So in as much as we can, leverage uh, gesture, leverage speech, uh, leverage natural ways of interacting, um, adapting, building and adapting interfaces based on rigorous analysis of users' actual abilities. So uh, in looking at, for example, touch, well, what are, the, what are an individual's capabilities to use a touch interface or to, or to interact with an audio interface? And how can we design uh, technologies to work better for them? Uh, I'm going to be talking about some work looking at context-aware accessibility. So as our devices get more, uh, gain more awareness of the world and of, of ourselves and what we're doing, how can we leverage that? Um, and also, a lot of the work we've been doing lately has really been looking at this intersection of hardware and software. So, uh, the first phase of my career, and for those of you who know my earlier work, really looking at 
uh, how do we take existing devices and change, uh, change the underlying software to make them more accessible? Uh, a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing recently has been looking at this intersection of hardware and software. Um, uh, so briefly, uh, as, as Mary said, I'm faculty at UMBC, and a lot of the work, uh, especially the more recent work, has been uh, coming out of our research lab, which is the prototyping and design lab, the PAD lab. Um, and mostly I bring this up to say that uh, we are recruiting PhD students. The deadline is February 1st, so if you're at the last minute and you haven't submitted your, all your grad apps, uh, you should do so um, and go check out our website. Uh, but in general, in this area, we've been working on looking at of hardware and software to help solve accessibility challenges, uh, looking with a few populations. So uh, blind and low vision individuals, which I'll be talking about today, uh, so work with older adults, and uh, work for people with cognitive and uh, related impairments. I'll be talking about a little bit about that too. Um, so I want to I show a few projects looking at how we can take this notion of assistive technology, so thinking about um, technology to help help individuals be more independent uh, and look at the way we interact with it and hopefully make it more interactive, make our interactions with it more natural, um, hopefully more fun and enjoyable. Uh, and I'll be talking in two areas, so some background on accessible touch interfaces and also some new work that I started uh, about a year ago looking at communications tools and how do we make communications tools more engaging, more usable. Okay, so I'll start with a, just a brief introduction of some of my past work on uh, accessible touch screens. Many of you have seen some of these slides probably three or four or five times. I know, I know Richard's probably seen them more than that. Um, it's a different, different talk. Yeah, different, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, we've got to keep it fresh. Uh, I'm going to talk about some new work in this area and building off of this um, and looking at how we can use accessible gestures in a new context, uh, which I'll talk about this project, uh, Access Lens. And then I'll talk about uh, two tools that we're working on, looking at uh, communications tools for people who have communications uh, disabilities. OK, so these slides you probably have seen probably a dozen times. Um, but to start with, uh, so I've been working in the area of accessible gestures and accessible touch interaction uh, since about 2008, so uh, for quite a while now. And uh, as, as time goes on, this, uh, this slide becomes less and less necessary uh, as people understand that the technologies that we use are really uh, ideally can be used by anyone. Um, but we still live in a world where a lot of the everyday technology that we use, including uh, touch screens, but also any, many other types of technology, are still inaccessible to, to uh, large groups of people. Uh, but it, we know now that touch screens and touch interactions are everywhere. Uh, so not just in our phones and our tablets, but now in PCs, uh, when we're sh out shopping, when we're voting, uh, and also uh, in home technologies. So for example, you might see this display here on the microwave. It actually isn't a touch screen, but it uses touch sensitive technology. And so a lot of the challenges that an individual might have with a touch screen also apply here. Um, so we have, we, it, it's safe to say now that touch interaction is, is ubiquitous and is going to stick around for a while. And so this is an important problem. And as, as our touch interfaces evolve, we also need to consider accessibility. Um, yeah, so just pointing out here again that it's not just uh, touch screens, but also uh, touch panels and that we can see them in a variety of, of technologies, so office equipment, home equipment. So really, uh, as touch inter interfaces become more ubiquitous, they have a, a greater impact on those who cannot use them or have difficulty using them. Uh, it's also the case that when we design for accessibility, we help lots of people. So not just someone who, someone who walks with a white cane or has a guide dog, but people with a range of visual uh, abilities. So, about 25 million people in the US identify as having some kind of visual impairment. Um, but an even greater group than that may benefit from uh, visual accessibility tools. So a study from Microsoft in 2004 said yeah, about 25% of computer users would benefit from technologies that helps with reading and with uh, visual information, uh, making visual information more accessible. And that's uh, whether or not they identify as blind or visually impaired. Um, and of course, in looking at touch, we know that touch is actually a very effective interaction technique for blind people. So if we think about Braille, so although Braille literacy is low, uh, those who are fluent in it can, are, uh, can read quite quickly and quite ably. Um, but also, that in thinking about natural interactions, we do use our hands. Uh, everyone uses our hands to explore their environment. And for someone who's not relying uh, on the visual channel as much, uh, this kind of feedback can be especially useful. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the past work, and then I want to talk about a new project uh, that I've been working on in this space. 
So uh, this, uh, these, these projects that I'm talking about here are, are part of my dissertation work. So looking at uh, trying to understand how touch and how mobile technologies could fit into the lives of uh, people with visual impairments. Uh, started looking at uh, just uh, getting a qualitative understanding of how these technologies are used. So I did some work with uh, Richard Ladner, among others, looking at how uh, individuals who are blind and, and visually impaired use mobile technologies and use touch technologies in their everyday lives. So did they have touch devices? Where did they encounter them? What did they do? Um, this work is also uh, the more design-oriented work that I'm going to talk about today is also uh, done more uh, performance studies, so looking at uh, how a blind or visually impaired person would perform gestures. And so we have a paper uh, from CHI 2011 looking at gesture performance across uh, sighted individuals versus blind or visually impaired individuals. Okay, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about some projects. I'm going to zoom through some of the early work in this space and talk about um, some new, wor new work, uh, which is actually going to be presented at CHI uh, this year, so you get a little bit of a preview on, on this project. but. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about a few projects looking in general at accessibility and touch and how we can design accessible touch interactions across a range of devices. As, as our devices change, so do our interactions with them. So this work uh, began actually now a, a paper that's getting older. Uh, this work with uh, Jake Wabrock and Jeff Bigham uh, called Slide Rule. And this was really one of, the first, uh, one of our first forays into making uh, gestures and touch accessible. So we looked at touchscreen smartphones as they were quickly becoming popular and uh, looked at, again, again, how we could take uh, an existing touch device and by changing the, the software, by changing the interaction and, uh, modes, could we make that accessible to someone who uh, could not see the device? And so we developed a prototype and we evaluated it. And I'll just tell you a little bit about how that works to give you a sense of um, Kind of the big idea here and how we're designing accessible touch and some of the insights that have, that have come from it. Uh, so this began with uh, interviews, with some observations, looking at uh, blind mobile device users who at the time were not using touchscreen devices, and a series of iterative prototyping, really looking at how we could take in this touchscreen phone, uh, and specifically without changing the hardware, and even not even using the existing buttons on the device. So we said our, our input uh, workspace, uh, our, our, the input that we're working with is a flat surface. Uh, how can we make that accessible? Uh, we used the iPhone at the time. Uh, all right, so if we think about uh, uh, interacting with a touchscreen device without visual feedback, we start to think about the, you know, we have a flat screen and we're getting very little feedback from it as it, as it is. Uh, uh, and it's relatively featureless. We're not getting any really uh, haptic feedback. And so when we think about how to, how to make gestures accessible, how to make this kind of uh, input device accessible, uh, first we, have to th we might think about an appropriate output. We say, OK, well, we could provide uh, haptic feedback. We could pro provide vibrational feedback. Uh, but uh, many, many, for many devices, including a lot of sm many smartphones, the kind of haptic feedback we can give from existing devices is quite limited. Um, we might rely on speech and audio, and so, okay, well, we have a visual interface, and there's been a lot of prior work in, on the desktop and in other computer interfaces of transforming uh, a visual interface into an audio interface. So we're going to design a screen reader for our phone. Okay, so, we, so we take our touch interface, and we just make things start talking and identifying themselves. Um, but this raises the question of, well, how, how do we provide input, and how do we navigate through this space? Uh, a lot of the traditional interfaces we use for a screen reader are keyboard-based. They have an idea of a cursor that we're moving through, through the, uh, a structured user interface. Uh, how does that change when we look at touch and gesture? So answering questions about, well, how do users touch the device? How do we lay out the screen? And how do we have a set of uh, usable and reliable gestures that someone who's blind is going to be able to use and uh, use comfortably and confidently? And so just to give you a sense of, of this, how we first took, the, took this uh, challenge on, we can think about our traditional smartphone interface. Uh, we'll have a, we have a grid of icons, and we interact with them uh, by looking at them, identifying where we want to interact, and touching. Uh, but when we, can solve, we can say, OK, well, let's make this accessible to someone who is blind by taking everything that's visual and representing it with audio. Uh, but we run into some problems, right? So, the user interface is really designed uh, spatially, so for easy visual use and visual scanning. Uh, 
but if we turn this into audio, well, how do we find stuff? And how do we lay things out on the screen? Um, uh, we also might have this uh, conflict here where white space is often good for visual interfaces. And for audio interfaces, it can be bad because it's essentially a dead zone. We're not getting the feedback that we want. Um, and in talking with, uh, with blind individuals about how they'd use a touch screen, they were really afraid about doing the wrong thing. This was the, this was the theme that came up most uh, in our early discussions was they didn't want to accidentally call someone that they're, they, you know, that they're not on speaking terms with or accidentally order something or accidentally delete something or all the other kinds of things that can happen when you're not getting good feedback and you're not in control of your, of your device. Um, and so we wanted to take these uh, challenges on and made a few uh, adjustments to the interaction with this device to make the device more accessible. Uh, so first was uh, lay, relaying out the uh, visual layout of the, of the interface. So rather than having this uh, nice visual grid, which is easy for visual scanning, we said took the entire touch surface and blew up all of the interactive elements on it uh, so that they're, first of all, easier to hit, but also uh, switching from a 1D or 2D interface to a 1D interface. So now if we're trying to find something on the screen, we're not searching every pixel on the screen with our finger trying to find what we're looking for, but we can actually search in a, uh, in a confident, controlled way uh, so here we have, rather than this 2D search, we can just scan from the top of the device to the bottom and hear everything that's there. Um, the other thing we have here now is we have a type of preview interaction. So rather than, uh, rather than things happening when you touch the screen, uh, in, in this work we, uh, we get feedback when we touch the screen. And when we want to select something or take some action, we perform an alternative gesture. And so the way we uh, implemented this for this slide rule project was with a, with a multi-touch tap. So we had a multi-touch touch screen. Um, we can feel on the screen through the options that we want to select. And when we find that one that we want, we can then indicate a selection. And the way we do that is we actually keep a finger where we want to select, so we don't have to worry about losing that when we lift our hand up, losing that context, and just touch on the screen with, uh, with a second finger on multi-touch. And so this is the basis for a lot of the work that came after that, um, both our work and also it's had influence uh, outside of that. Uh, and really, the, but the fundamental uh, design considerations here were taking this touchscreen device and enabling risk-free exploration. So I can interact with the device in a way that I know is going to be safe, nothing is going to happen, uh, and providing safe, reliable, usable techniques when I do want to interact with the device. Um, so I'm going to show some more videos later on. So I'm actually going to skip the video of this, but it's on my web page. Um, just to give you, uh, give you a sense of, of where we were, uh, this paper is now uh, getting older now. So it's, you know, if it were a child, it would be up and walking and, uh, and talking and saying things and about almost you know, ready to go to school. Um, and so if we look at mobile devices you know, in 2007, 2008, uh, the, it was quite different. Landscape was quite different. Touchscreen devices were more rare. And so when we tested out this technology, we actually compared it to uh, devices that our blind participants were using at the time, which were mostly uh, phys used physical buttons controls. So you'd have a four-way control uh, or an additional buttons for interacting with the screen. And so we tested this, this more uh, gesture-focused interaction and compared it to the button-focused interaction with some applications that we developed on both platforms and just looked at how fast could tasks be completed and, and how accurately. And just to uh, sum up very quickly, uh, so all, seven of our participants preferred this gesture interface to the interface that they were uh, more familiar with, the more traditional button interface. So they liked, uh, they liked using gestures. Uh, and they were actually faster at performing the gesture interface than the button-based interface. And there are a few reasons why that is. Um, but one is just, just in general that there was, it was a richer input space. So whereas with a button interface, if you want to get to the 20th item on the list, you have to say button, 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 button 20 times. Uh, with gestures, you might be able to navigate through um, more quickly. Um, but we did see more errors. Uh, actually, participants didn't make any errors with their, with their button interfaces because they knew them well. Um, and so this, was, this is, this is a, a, an issue that uh, we're still wrestling with and still trying to understand. Um, but in general, we found that taking this uh, gesture-based device, which was really designed around visual interaction, uh, we could adapt it to something that was more, um, more usable for uh, someone who couldn't see. Uh, and so, so we followed up with, in this work in uh, a few different areas. Uh, and, but also, uh, the idea of using these kinds of accessible gestures 
and, and this non-visual uh, non -visual output but gestural input way of interaction is actually quite popular. So um, estimates have been as high as 100,000 users using uh, accessibility features on touchscreen phones. Um, that number might be a little high. It's hard to get a good sense. And, and whoever, if anyone knows, they're not actually telling in great detail. Um, but now we see uh, now we see these types of accessible gesture interfaces on um, on a wide variety of, of mobile devices. So Apple devices, Google devices, hopefully Microsoft devices uh, soon. Uh, and so uh, this work really started off uh, a, a lot of my dissertation work and looking in general at well, if we have accessible gestures, if we can make gesture, uh, gestures accessible, what can we actually do with them? And, uh, and so in, in, in this work, I looked at what were the limitations of this, er of, of this initial approach, and how could we extend it to work in, in other places? Um, so I'm going to very briefly describe some earlier work I actually conducted here at MSR uh, with Mary Morris and uh, Daniel Wigdor and also Anushka Perkins from, uh, from the accessibility group and uh, Richard Ladder and Jake Walbrook, my PhD advisors. Uh, and so I'll just tell you a little bit about how, starting from this core and some, some uh, base principles about accessible gestures, how we could extend this to a different device. And so in this work, we were looking primarily at large touch screens. So uh, very large tablets, but also tabletop computers and other large interactive displays like Microsoft Surface or PixelSense. Uh, and thinking about the kinds of inter uh, interfaces and the kinds of interactions that we'd see on this device uh, versus a smartphone, right? So when we look at our smartphones, we see a lot of the interfaces are, are quite simplified. They're very basic. Uh, but as we scale to larger interfaces, we start to see more complex spatial layouts. We see, start to see more complex information. Um, we also see in looking at these applications uh, that location and spatial layout can often be quite important. So if you think about interacting with maps, or sorting documents on a touch screen or playing games. Uh, it's not just important to know what's on the screen, but we also really want to know where it is. Uh, and a lot of the, the techniques at the time focusing on smaller devices, including uh, our own slide roll project, but also VoiceOver, which was uh, the Apple screen reader, which is, uh, as, of, as of now, the most popular uh, screen reader for touch screen mobile devices, uh, really had made a lot of benefit from taking this uh, spatial interface and turning it into something that could be scanned linearly, just like I showed you with slide rule. Um, but we lose then the spatial information that, uh, that, help, that might be quite necessary for some tasks that we're performing. And so in looking at how we can take, uh, how we can make an accessible touchscreen where we maintain some of this accessible information, uh, we first started by going to people's offices and hanging out and looking at how they organize their space. So I, I spent time, uh, this is an internship project, started as an intern project. Uh, going around to the offices of, of blind office workers and, and talking with them about how they organize their space, how they strategized, uh, where they put new things, what did they did if they lost something, and so forth, uh, to try to get a sense of what are some of, the, uh, s some of their concerns were and also strategies about organizing their space. Uh, and our paper, which is at, uh, was in WIS 2011, tells us uh, a bit more about some of the strategies that they're used here. Um, but I'll talk about some of the, uh, some of the strategies that, that we developed and, uh, and built into this pro a project which we called Access Overlays. So the idea here is that we have a large touchscreen application. So here we've got a world map app on the Microsoft Surface. And we want to maintain the original app. We don't want to write a new app, and we don't want to drastically change the interface. But what we can do here is we can take this, uh, this interface and add up, provide additional support that's going to help us uh, help a blind or visually impaired person navigate this space. And so we tried a few different interactive strategies to make it easier to search this space, to, uh, to find things, and also to understand the relationships between different objects on the screen. And I'll mention these just briefly. Uh, these will actually come up again in the next uh, part of the talk. So uh, first was to take all the items on the screen and project them to uh, the borders of the screen. So here we have our map, and then we have corresponding icons for each of the map items along the edges. So now we have, in some sense, the best of both worlds. So we can explore in 2D by putting our hands on the map and feeling around, but we can also scan by just touching and, and sliding along the edge of the, of the table. Um, we also looked at ways of uh, dealing with dead space. So instead of um, having 
a, a set of discrete icons on screen and then a lot of dead space between them. How could we fill that space? So we could use uh, Voronoi tessellation in this case, uh, similar to the bubble cursor, although while the bubble cursor helps you select uh, targets, here with access overlays, we're trying to make it easier to find targets and understand their relationships. Um, so we can provide this overlay onto an existing app uh, and provide a mode where the user can explore and understand uh, spatial uh, relationships between objects on screen. Finally, we looked at the combination of touch gestures and uh, voice commands to explore. So uh, can we use voice commands to query an interface on a touch screen and combine that with touch? So we can ask questions like, what's near, what's near here? Or where is a specific location on screen relative to where I'm touching? So to evaluate these techniques, we had a few that we liked. Um, we tested them out with uh, blind computer users. And we were particularly interested in uh, not just traditional metrics like task completion time uh, but and errors, but also uh, spatial understanding. So we had uh, participants perform tasks where they explored a map. And then we asked them questions about the map. So uh, was this city to the east or west of the other? Or how close were they? Um, to help see if these techniques actually helped increase the understanding of the original layout. Um, and again, to, to go through here somewhat quickly, um, the techniques that we developed, in particular this voice-based technique and the edge-based projection technique, were faster than both the, the browsing technique, the tessellation technique, and also voiceover, which is our comparison as the kind of gold standard. Uh, and also, all three of our techniques improved spatial understanding. So participants answered more questions correctly after, when they used these techniques versus when they used voiceover, which is a non-spatial, non-spatially oriented technique. So it's not surprising that this is the case, but what's interesting here is that our techniques did seem to help with this problem. Um, and in general, of the techniques that we tried, uh, participants enjoyed uh, both the uh, speech-based interaction and the edge browsing. Uh, about equally, so they were both quite popular, uh, although the, the voice, uh, voice interaction was slightly more popular with a lot of caveats. So they said, oh, I really like this one, but I wouldn't use it here, and I wouldn't use it here, and I wouldn't use it you know, if someone else is around. Um, but in general, these techniques seem to be enjoyed. Uh, and one thing, uh, w one thing that was interesting was it, there was no clear winner here, and a lot of the participants in the study actually said that they wanted to be able to use all of these techniques and kind of apply them. So in thinking about how we make future screen readers for our touchscreen devices, whether it's our tablets or our large touchscreens, um, this idea that we might have different kind of modes that we can apply uh, seems, seems promising. Uh, and we explore this to some degree here, and I think there's, there's more interesting work to be done here. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the last piece uh, related to uh, accessible gestures that I'm going to talk about today. And so looking at the limitations of, of this pro work to date, well, we looked at small devices and we said, OK, well, we seem to understand small devices. We looked at larger devices and made some progress here. Uh, but with all the work that we've done with accessible gestures, uh, we're still limited by the problem that a lot, of these, uh, the, a lot of the devices out in the world are still not accessible. And so these accessible gestures seem to be quite useful. People like them. But they're limited to a, to a small set of devices. And so I was really interested in, in answering the question of, well, if we, if we have these accessible gestures and we have a set that people seem to like, uh, what else can we do with them? Where else can we use them? And so I'll talk about the, the last, uh, last project here in this space, which is uh, a project called Access Lens. Um, and so this will be presented at CHI this year. I hope to see you all there. It's in Paris. Um, uh, and so this is work that started uh, at the tail end of my dissertation and has been developing uh, uh, with the help of some uh, of a student, Brian Fry, uh, and, uh, and my colleagues. And so what we're looking at here is how can we take this notion of accessible gestures and use it in a different place? And starting with the real goal of if a, a person who was blind or visually impaired walked up to a touch screen or some other device that was not accessible, um, could they interact with it in a way that they're familiar with using the techni techniques that they know? So could we take this ATM and could we apply the kinds of gestural overlays that, that I've shown you to it so that the person can explore it using gestures? Um, and we'll come back later to the, the technical hows and whys and what we can and we can't do. But just thinking in terms of interaction of how can we take advantage of what we've shown so far and apply it to the real world? And so uh, this is a project that, uh, again, is in the space of hardware and software. So. 
uh, started really thinking about cameras, about mobile cameras, uh, and in particular, either a wearable camera or a camera in your workspace that could look at what you're doing and could identify items in the world, identify text on them or other information, and then actually enable the user to use his or her hands to explore that space and to get audio feedback about, so speech feedback, other kinds of feedback about their environment. Um, <clears throat> so there are a few use cases that we're very excited about here. One is to uh, access touch screens that provide uh, by, their own, uh, by themselves little or no accessibility features. So these still exist. Uh, and even on devices that have good screen reader support, uh, like some of the more popular tablets, uh, a lot of the applications still aren't are designed in an accessible way because the designers uh, don't follow the correct guidelines or they make some mistake and that information is inaccessible. Uh, but I was also interested in looking at how we could use gestures to explore uh, analog data. So thinking about reading your mail, thinking about reading paper maps, thinking about reading other kinds of documents, thinking about reading appliances in the environment. And so. Uh, so this is a, a prototype that, that I built, that we built, and we've been evaluating versions of this uh, for the past, oh, about the past year, uh, with blind individuals. And so you can see here, this is one of our prototypes, and it's an it's a IKEA lamp base with the, the lamp cut off and a camera mounted on it. And so it clips onto the workspace. So uh, the idea is that you could have it in your, in your workspace and uh, push it out of the way when you're not using it. Uh, it's a lot like uh, the kind of magnifier that a low vision user might use in terms of uh, it's something on your desk that you could use to scan something or read something. Uh, but it provides some additional features in that we can actually use gestures to interact with data. Um, so I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you a video in just a minute. Uh, but I want to say just a, a little bit first of how it worked. Uh, first of all, this built on some prior work that I had done, a system called Bonfire, which was looking at, at gestural interaction on everyday surfaces. Uh, and so uh, mostly I include this just, just to tell you kind of how it came about and why the design is what it was. And, uh, and so we began really looking at if we had a laptop that was aware of the space around it, what kinds of interactions could we do? In the case of Bonfire, we combined this with output via a Pico projector. Uh, but in general, we were interested in looking at how a computer, uh, especially a mobile computer, could be made aware of the environment and enable interactions with the real world. Um, and so um, just briefly, basically, we're using techniques adopted, uh, adapted from Bonfire to, uh, to scan the environment, to identify objects in the environment, and to enable gesture interaction with those uh, objects. Um, there's more detail about this in the paper, and I'm also happy to, to say more later on. But in general, the idea is that we can take a document or some object, put it in our workspace, and the, uh, the software can identify the new object, can correct for perspective or skew if we have an object that, that is flat and uh, and we know some, at least something about it. So we know things that look approximately the size and shape of an of a 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. We can then use uh, OCR and text identification techniques to identify text on an object. And so this is the point where if we had a scanner, we can say, OK, we can do this with our scanner and scan the text. Uh, but what we're doing here is not only scanning, uh, scanning text, but identifying where it is in the document so that we can explore it. We do some OCR, we correct some identifications, or at least attempt to. And then we can use the same camera that we're using to capture documents to actually track gestures. So we can track hands in the workspace, look at where they're pointing, and give feedback based on what we know previously about the document, and now where the user's hand is to give them feedback. Um, so when thinking about how this, how this might actually be used in real life, um, you know, it, it is sometimes useful, as, as we've discussed before, to explore spatial documents and to get spatial understanding. So whether it's exploring a map, whether it's finding just the one part on your electricity bill that you want to find when you know where it is, so you want to find that exactly, um, or other kinds of spatial documents, uh, being able to explore the document using gestures seems to be, seems to be useful. Uh, but it can be quite time consuming to explore this space. And so we're actually using uh, the access overlays feature that we, that we developed previously to help explore paper documents uh, more efficiently. So I will show you a quick demo of this. Document detected. Starting OCR. Recognized Lake City. So we're scanning our map of Seattle Recognized neighborhoods. University District. Uh, Recognized Capturing, Capturing Recognized text. Recognized Queen Anne. Recognized Capitol Hill. Recognized Downtown. 
Recognize Rainier Valley. Recognize West Seattle. Okay. And now, now we can track, so tracking the hand using computer vision techniques, we can start to Rainier get feedback Valley. about where, West Seattle. where objects are on the Downtown. page as I touch Capital Hill. Downtown. Oh, yeah. Added access overlay to right edge. And Eight then items. one thing we can do here is overlay West Seattle. to make the document Hold easier to scan, we actually add a virtual index. So it's on the side of the physical page, right? There's nothing actually there. Uh, but the user can scan along the edge of that page and get uh, an ordered index of I items and then get, as I'll show you in just a second, feedback toward that, toward that goal. Oh, I broke it. Doc, recognize Rainier Valley. Recognize West Seattle. West Seattle, Capitol Hill. Okay. Overlay West that. Seattle. Hold here for directions. Overlay Rainier Valley. Hold here for directions. Overlay downtown. Overlay Hold here for directions. Hill. Hold here for directions. Locating target Capitol Hill. Left. 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 So we can actually up. track the up. finger in real time up. and give them up. guidance up. toward the Capitol Hill. Okay. Um, so we can also use this with other devices. This is a mock-up of an iPad app that looks like an ATM screen. And again, we can use uh, Access Lens to explore the screen although we have to do this a little bit differently, as you might imagine, in that uh, here we're not actually interfacing with the device at all, but we're just getting feedback about what's on the screen and, and what we're pointing toward. Um, so, um, so this, as I said, uh, our preliminary work in this area will be published at CHI this year, um, but we're interested in, in exploring other applications as well. So uh, our, probably the next step is to really look at mobile and how to make this a more mobile interface, so interacting with more documents out in the real world. Um, this works fairly robustly in a, in a workspace with, where we know the lighting and there are not a lot of environmental changes. But turning this into something that you can use everywhere uh, is, is the next, uh, next big challenge. Uh, and looking at, also looking at the, f the form factor for hardware that we want. So do we actually want something like the Google Project Glass? Do we want a wearable camera like I have here in this demo? Do we want to hold a phone and wave that around? It's not quite clear. Uh, and so we're also interested. And then looking at other ways to bring in the environment to, better under, to, to make this work better. So bringing in context-aware OCR. So if I'm at the ATM, uh, maybe prioritizing terms that are related to my transaction there. Um, and also, how can we use this interface to recognize other spatial data? So uh, we actually developed a module for exploring colors so that you can touch an image, and it will tell you what colors are under your fingertips as you're feeling around. This is something from one of our participants who was really interested in, uh, in exploring art. Uh, but thinking about how we could use this kind of platform for recognizing objects and then enabling gestural e exploration of those objects uh, as uh, to explore different kinds of information. Yeah, Sherry. So can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs between this and something like the KMV Reader, which at least tries to uh, give you feedback in real time also with your Sure, uh, sure. Documents. Sure. So the KNFB Reader is a... Is it a addressing similar problems but through uh, different form factors. So one of the real challenges uh, with a lot of the smartphone-based solutions is uh, where am I aiming the camera? What is the camera looking at? And so uh, this, is, this is a challenge for anything uh, uh, and where we're trying to explore something. Uh, and the question is, you know, what, is the best way, what, what is the best way to explore? Is, is it moving a camera around or is it using gesture? And so uh, we were particularly interested in exploring this, this opportunity because of all the work we had built up in gestures and the, the kinds of shortcuts we have learned. So looking at using access overlays, for example, as a, as a way of exploring uh, spatial data. Um, I think there are, at least in its current form, there are definitely trade-offs in terms of uh, it's not going to work anywhere. You have to be able to put your hands on something. And um, I think there's still a question about when we're moving, where the camera is going to be and what it's going to see. So that's, that's something I think we're going to keep looking at. Um, OK, so just uh, actually, I will skip our ongoing work in touch interaction. There's uh, quite a lot of it. Uh, again, if you're interested in collaborating and doing research, so looking at things like 3D printed tactile graphics. Uh, we just started a project with NASA to print uh, 3D versions of, uh, of star clusters for blind kids working with NFB and NASA. Really excited about that. Uh, looking at accessibility and collaboration, so this is a problem I'm really interested in. Uh, looking at how we take these 2D interface or these interfaces that are primarily audio-based, and and bring them back together with visual interfaces, so blind and sighted people can collaborate together. Um, looking at how we can make accessible hardware and so forth. Um, so this is still a very active area. 
Um, but I wanted to I wanted to end this talk with just a little bit of some of some of our newer work uh, and looking at a different population uh, just to get a sense of kind of how some of these techniques might translate to a different group. So I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about about this project. Um, so this is uh, this is a project that uh, we presented at Assets this year. Uh, note the slide template change. Um, and so basically, we were looking at communication tools for adults with aphasia uh, or other kind of uh, linguistic uh, disabilities and developing tools that could use uh, context awareness and, and adaptive interfaces to make these uh, tools more accessible. So to give you the, the very high level view, uh, aphasia is a neurological disorder uh, and it affects an individual's ability to understand or produce language uh, written or spoken. So it can be any of, those, any of that set. Uh, and it's most often caused by stroke, so some damage to the brain. Uh, and uh, it's noteworthy that uh, typically aphasia is something that affects uh, uh, communications ability but does not affect cognitive ability otherwise. So these aren't necessarily people who are cognitively impaired, uh, but they have communications difficulties. Uh, the most well-known person with aphasia that you, pro you guys probably know is uh, uh, Senator Gabriel Giffords, Representative Gabby Giffords, who had a he head injury and now has language difficulties. Um, uh, but aphasia is a very broad term and can affect, uh, describe a wide variety of abilities. Uh, and so for, for those individuals who do, use, uh, do have this condition, uh, it can be quite challenging to communicate uh, with anyone in, in any format. So uh, speaking tends to be quite difficult. So uh, summoning words, think about having a word on the tip of your tongue, but that's half the words in your vocabulary or more. Right? So it can be quite serious, can be quite uh, a stressful situation. And people who have, these, uh, have aphasia uh, typically still have some um, motor ability to speak. So it's not like uh, Stephen Hawking or someone who has full language capability but doesn't have the motor ability to speak. Uh, this is someone who uh, typically has the ability to speak physically but lacks the, the language skills. Uh, and so they use a wide variety of tools, which we refer to here as, uh, or more broadly, as augmentative and alternative communication <laughs> technology. Uh, this, uh, this term also describes a huge uh, variety of technologies for a, a very large population. Um, uh, here we're pr particularly looking, for a, looking at adults with aphasia. And so when we look at the tools that they used, uh, typically we see some combination of uh, typing-based tools. So they can type out words, often with some assistance, often quite slowly. Um, and then often uh, will play a sound. So this app, for example, they can type a word if they remember how to spell it, or approximately. They can say, speak it, and the computer will speak it. And then once they hear it, they can actually say the word themselves. Uh, but without that audio feedback, they might not necessarily do that. Um, they also often use these kind of menu-based tools. So you see these for also for uh, children with autism, adults with autism, people with uh, more cognitive impairments, where you have some kind of uh, ontological model or hierarchy of types of words and terms that the user can browse through and tap and get feedback either as an image or a spoken word as a prompt that can help them recall the word. Um, so these are, these are pop, uh, common tools, but not necessarily popular. Uh, the, the adults that we're working with with aphasia often really hated these tools, but they relied on them because otherwise they, their communication ability was quite limited. And so, in looking at how they're using AAC tools, uh, we saw a, a few challenges. So first is uh, we have this hierarchical navigation. So if I want to say coffee, I might say food and drinks, go into the drinks category, and then go to coffee. Well, if you have difficulty recognizing words, uh, going through a hierarchical menu is just repeated, uh, repeated torture. Um, so it can be a, re a reading challenge, but also a potential motor challenge. Uh, many participants have stroke as well. Uh, and we found that many of the people with aphasia that we worked with ha really had difficulty keeping items organized. So even when they used these tools, if they added their own terms, they tended to keep them in one big list rather than separating them out. And you, you can probably, it's probably not surprising to know that um, making categories is actually quite difficult. And so while they had these tools, off, there were some challenges to using them and often they ignored the tools. And so the work that we began with this project was really looking at how can we use more contextual data to, uh, to improve the usability of these kinds of tools. Uh, and leveraging our knowledge of our participants of and kind of where they go and who they know. So if you think about your own conversation in everyday life, uh, maybe you talk about a certain topic with your coworkers, you talk about sports with your coworkers, but when you talk with your parents, you typically talk about opera. And 
Well, these patterns might change over time, or there might be uh, you know, current events that are very exciting. Uh, there tend to see, these tend to be somewhat stable over time. You're probably going to talk about floss at the dentist's office more than you do elsewhere. Okay. Um, and so we were looking at how, uh, how to use context awareness to associate terms with locations and people to make these interfaces easier to use, but also looking at how do we engage with, uh, with individuals who have communication uh, disabilities to design this technology so that they can understand how it works, so they can be invested in how it develops. Uh, so this work was conducted in a part of our ongoing project with uh, an aphasia center in Baltimore. Uh, there are about, actually now, closer to 50 or 60 active members, um, all adults who have had aphasia, most who have had strokes. Uh, ranging from about late 20s to I think 100 is the oldest one, so uh, really quite wide range of abilities. Uh, and we've been working with this group uh, for almost a year now and uh, have been working with smaller design teams. So the work today was with a group mostly of five people and then a few, a few occasional helpers. And just to give you a little sense of, of how, uh, how diverse this group is, um, I'm not going to ask you to read all these details, but we had five people who were most active in developing the prototype. And they really range from uh, P1, who has difficulty retrieving words, especially nouns. So you might forget what something was called. To P5 here, who is unable to read or write, has severely impaired comprehension, and can speak a few single words only. So he had about five words that he could speak reliably. Uh, and this is actually, um, working with such a di diverse group is actually uh, largely from feedback from our collaborators at the Aphasia Center who said, yeah, we know you guys want to come in and work with the highest functioning people and build prototypes that work well for them. Uh, we really want you to get to know the whole group and understand. Uh, so we developed some early prototypes uh, through our visits to the center, so my visits and, and uh, our students, and combined a, a number of methods which are described in the assets paper, so looking at observations, interviews, tech demonstrations, uh, focus groups. Uh, when we got to the really tricky stuff, like how do you describe a context-aware computing uh, system to someone with a communication disability, we really relied a lot on storyboards and drawing and play acting and building lo-fi prototypes. Uh, and so, uh, so looking at this kind of idea of context, we can imagine many different con uh, uses of context. And uh, these, we generated these in collaboration with our research partners. Um, for this current work, we focus primarily on location and conversation partner as a way to, uh, to scope interaction. So we developed a prototype it was on, a, on the iPad. And it was a simil uh, simple kind of uh, uh, menu-based AAC system, like the ones we saw before, but with the additional information of context. So uh, at any time, you could press a, a kind of sync button, and it would, it would find your location. And you could also uh, identify your conversation partner, either using the camera uh, although it was more popular to actually just pick from a menu if you were talking, talking to. Uh, and this system actually develops over time a set of, uh, a set of preferences, so such, knowing such that whenever I talk to Kyle, Kyle and I talk about piano, because Kyle plays the piano. And we typically talk about music in school. Um, so the idea is primarily that we have another way of, uh, of organizing and focusing this interface on a way that works better. Um, so we tested this early prototype. Uh, again, this is, this is ongoing work, so uh, we're still trying to get a sense of how this will work in, in, in the real world, and there are some obstacles to that, but um, revised our prototype through several rounds based on feedback and uh, some general ratings from um, using aphasia-friendly uh, materials. So in general, our participants so far are really enthusiastic about this. They've used it quite a bit in the center, and now we're looking to get it so that they can use it out in the real world. Um, they were especially excited uh, about location awareness. That was the, the feature that they were most thrilled about. Uh, and came up with a, a variety of places they'd want to be able to use it. So uh, at the Aphasia Center, certainly, since they spend a lot of time there, but also really interested in taking it out and trying it out at, at paratransit, at the doctor's office, at supermarkets, and going to restaurants and trying new things. And so, um, so we're working on doing the field evaluation so we can actually do that. Um, all right. So. Uh, our paper presents some guidelines on conducting participatory design for people with aphasia, especially when we're working on context-aware technology. But you can check out the paper if you're, if you're interested. Um, so we're, looking, we're working on an extended field deployment. We're also looking at ways to bring in uh, additional contextual factors. So news and current events is one that our participants are particularly excited about. And also how to beef up the, the 
uh, the context awareness so that we can suggest possible relevant discussion tactics and present them in a way that's not going to be distracting and frustrating. Um, so I'm going to talk just for one minute about the other places this work is going. So um, there's a, a project that we're working on with uh, my PhD student, Lula Albar, looking at uh, how we can use pictures as a communication tool in a more meaningful way. So one thing that we were, we were interested to learn and didn't know before, but uh, a lot of the people, at least in this aphasia center, are really avid photographers, and they're very skilled photographers. This is, this is a photo from a set of a, of a photo, um, photo gallery sale that they had. Um, and so they're taking a lot of photos, and they also use photos to communicate. But typically, the way they do that is very driven by the conversational partner who doesn't have aphasia. So they might hold up a photo of someone, and the person might say, oh, who's that? Is that your, is that your cousin? And they'll go, mm -hmm. Oh, is that your daughter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's your daughter. OK, well, where is that? Is that at school? Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. You know, and so it's very driven by the conversational partner, which can be really difficult. And so one thing we're, uh, uh, that Lula is looking at is how can we take the data that we have in photos and actually use that to improve the interface, or, or, to, or to organize the data and to provide uh, another way of communication. So um, taking these kind of unsorted photos here and starting to provide uh, contextual data about the photo based on what we know. So if we have a photo, we can say, uh, I was at the cafe, and I have, maybe I have a location tag, and I was with Sarah, right? So maybe it recognizes Sarah's face, or uh, maybe a long time ago I tagged Sarah's face in one image, and now all the images are tagged with Sarah, and last week. So looking at this both as a way to organize photos and also as a way to, as a communication tool. So I can show this photo and get almost an automatically generated story about the photo just by just from data that we have or data that we've we've added previously uh, we're also looking at other ways to improve the motor accessibility so this is actually work from uh, Carl Wiegand who's a student at uh, Northeastern but we're planning to collaborate and looking at how we can use gestures and communication tools so bringing it all together in that way okay so just to wrap up uh, so I showed a number of projects in the two areas really uh, starting and looking at accessible touch interfaces for blind and visually impaired people. Uh, so a few projects across a, a range of devices and based on analysis of how, uh, how blind people interact with technology. So understanding their abilities both qualitatively and quantitatively to build technology that works for them. And uh, looking at how we can use context awareness to improve these communication tools for people with communication disorders. Uh, and I just want to kind of tie it back to my original point which was uh, in thinking about work for the future to say that a lot of the work that we're, we've done in accessibility and traditionally has been reactive, right? So we take things, cool things from mainstream technologies and make them accessible. Uh, I think uh, sometimes we take cool things from mainstream technologies and use that to make other things more accessible, like some of the projects here. Uh, but I think it's useful to think about how can we get ahead of the curve and especially how we think about accessible interaction and how to make that something that's going to work well for individuals of, of diverse abilities. And I've showed a few ways that we can do that and can continue to explore. So drawing on context when possible, uh, util utilizing existing data that we have about people and what they do, and to really focus on interaction methods that work for these individuals. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you very much. And I ended before you guys have to leave. I actually have one question. Sure. The access overlays. I understand if mm -hmm. you took a picture, saw a piece of paper moving my hand around, it wouldn't be a big deal. But if it's an ATM screen, does it essentially attempt to explain mm -hmm. where to touch the mm -hmm. screen? Right, right. Okay. So, so, so that's a really good question. So, um, you know, we really struggled with thinking about, uh, in this project, assuming assuming that the world is hostile, right? So when I first started talking about this, they said, oh yeah, but the ATMs are going to have Bluetooth and they're going to talk to your phone and they're going to turn that on. And, and those things might happen, um, but they haven't yet. And so thinking about what can the individual do to empower themselves through the technology that they have. And so, um, and thinking about how you interact with a touch screen, uh, one of the real challenges there is uh, if you can't connect to the touch screen, you still have this problem of the interface can't really lay itself out and it can't, you can't change the gestures, right? So. Uh, and interacting with touch screens, which we've really just started to explore with, with the access lens, um, you typically have to either hover your finger over, which doesn't work very well, or because we can add accessible menus, 
you can, we can add, for example, an index to the side of the screen. So you touch along the uh, outside of the screen on the edge and get an index and then get guidance toward where something is. So like we're in the video, it was saying like up, 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 uh, left. Um, the other place you can do that is with, um, so one feature that I didn't show here is with uh, voice commands and voice search. So if you knew, for example, that you wanted the withdraw button, you could just say withdraw and it could tell you where to move your finger above the withdraw button. Um, it's not an ideal situation and there are, still the, there's, there are still potential problems that you might accidentally press another key, but it's a way to give us information that otherwise is, is hard to get. So. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, Jessica. Um, with photo stories, have you considered also perhaps using like, video to do the same thing, to accomplish the same task? Say more about that. Oh, okay. So it sounds like you have a photo to um, categorize um, the situation. Mm -hmm. um, how about like recording video to mm -hmm. also do the same thing? Is that something? Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that, yeah. So one thing I, I glossed over a little bit is the idea that we're taking these huge collections of data that people already have, right? And so whether that's for for the participants we've been working with, that's mostly photos that they have these huge photo collections. And so what we'd like to be able to do is say we have some some app, and you just run all the photos you've ever taken through it, or you run your Picasso collection through it, or whatever that is, and then get out a bunch of structured data of, oh yeah, you tend to take pictures of these six people, if you tag them, now we have a nice way of searching, searching this interface. Um, I think you could do the same thing for video. The, the challenge there is uh, it, it's easier to do the more automatic analysis with photos, but I think that's, and especially as people take more videos, of how can we do that to, to communicate? And definitely playing the video itself is also really, really valuable. Um, one of the things that about the population that we've been working with is they really don't want the technology to speak for them. Like it's not a case where they press a button and the and the device says, you know, hi Jessica. Uh, what they want to do, they that what they'd rather do, and if they have to do this, they would have the device say that to themselves, and then they could say it to you, and that's actually quite common. So they they try to use the technology to help them speak rather than to have the technology speak for them, and that's something that's very particular to the level of ability. This is a cultural thing too, where they all come to the same center, and that's kind of the norm. So I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, Alan. Uh, it's sort of a philosophical question about your use of participatory design. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were doing user-centered design, you know, you'd be focusing on the users and trying to figure out what they want and so forth. And at least in participatory design in its classic form, mm -hmm. you're actually sharing power over mm -hmm. the design. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do that? And, and what are the issues around it when you're working with people with Communication difficulties like this. Right, right. So I, that's a very good point. I'm, I'm using the term somewhat colloquially in the sense of, you know, we had a team of design partners who were giving, giving feedback and setting the direction. So they're helping set it priorities for the work that we did. But I think it was not as equitable as, as it would like to be and maybe, maybe as, you know, stretching the term participatory design a little bit. Um, I think one of the challenges is just it is really difficult for, uh, and, and in terms of how these individuals interact in the everyday world, even their conversations are more about selecting from a set than about generation, right? So when you talk with someone with aphasia, you learn if you have training in this, you, you tend to say things like, oh, are you, are you hungry right now? And they'll say yes or no. Or, oh, are you tired? Oh, are you, you know, are you, are you feeling really good? You know, so you kind of go through the list and then they kind of more vote rather than, so I think getting kind of evocative feedback, at least in this population, is really difficult. So I would say that we haven't really done that yet, and I think I'd be interested, you know. Uh, Do you have ideas how you could? So one, I mean, one place, and, and this is uh, uh, some of the early work that had happened uh, with HCI and aphasia from uh, UBC, so Joanna McGrenery and, and et al. We looked at working with, uh, with other members of the support team, so working with the, the speech language uh, therapists, with family members. And so we've done some of that as well, working with staff. Um, working with the individuals directly, I think, um, you know, I think there's a possibility for more creative tools, like making the creative tools more accessible to them. And so, in our population right now, I don't, I don't think they're doing that. You know, we don't really have, to, we don't, we're not really set up to do that. But I think if we had a way that they can more directly manipulate the kinds of things that we're working with, that might be something um, that that would bring us in that direction. But we should talk about that sometime because I'm interested. A question. Sherry, you had a question before. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I had a question slash 
suggestion. Okay, cool. So in, in exploring ATMs, I wonder if there's um, a way to, like, it's probably not a capacitive touch screen, but if you can imagine wearing a glove or something mm -hmm. with which you can explore with one finger, because the problem is, like Cindy mentioned, that you can't actually explore the screen without mm -hmm. accident. Right. You'd have to kind of hover. Uh, which is really oh, so hard. you're basically saying, oh, so with a capacitive screen, you could put on a, right, you, you could, could put a stopper, on yeah. Finger and then, you know, use your second one once you've found your yeah. location. So I wonder if you could do something like that, since you are thinking in the direction of hard Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah. I, ha I hadn't considered that. So I think, uh, yeah, definitely. A lot of these are resistive touchscreens, and then we have a, a, and so actually, that's less of a problem, because in, in some cases, if the sensitivity is, is low enough, then you can actually just kind of graze the touchscreen, right? Since you're not, so you can explore on a resistive touchscreen through touching very lightly. Right, or maybe you can put something over the touchscreen. I don't know. Yeah, right. no, I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting, yeah, it's an interesting question when we haven't figured it out yet. But I like that idea of having something like a, it's almost like a, it's like a, um, I don't know, some kind of protector. Oh, cool. Yeah, Mary. Could you talk a little bit about vessels, particularly it seems like a lot of your work mm -hmm. uses kind of the edge of, of things mm -hmm. as a landmark for blind users, and it seems like industrial design is focusing on making vessels disappear mm -hmm. and be very seamless for mm -hmm. the screen edge, and how does that affect, you know, usability? Yeah, so this is, this is a real problem, uh, and this has come up in work that we've done too, of looking at where you have, yeah, this design where there is no the touchscreen doesn't cover the whole surface, but there's no uh, tactile indicator, right? You've got a sheet of glass over it, for example, where you don't know when the touch-sensitive part e ends. Um, in the past, we've kind of, in several occasions, just kind of worked around this by using tape and other kinds of tactile things and you know, making a minor modification to the hardware. Uh, and that works, but it's, prob you know, it's not going to necessarily work in every situation. Um, I think one, one piece that's interesting is, you know, it seems to be that the, also the screens are getting closer to the edge now. So I think this may be less of a problem as we go on where the be bezels, if the bezels go away, then you have at least the edge of the device maybe as a way to interact. Um, I think the other, you know, thinking about the other problem of when we do have these devices, how, do you, how does the user know when they've gone off the edge? I think that's something that we could, we could look at the interaction of that and giving feedback so when, they, when we see the finger, because we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of the mainstream devices now have gestures where you swipe in from the edge, for example, right? So we should be able to see the other way and say, oh, you slipped off, you slipped off the screen. I'm going to give you feedback even though I'm not getting any input from you. So that, that would be one thing we could look at. Do you, in practice, do you Mary, mm -hmm. yeah. before you go on, a bunch of us have to leave, so I just want to apologize. So I want to have a question. Sorry. Right. Great talk. Thanks for coming here. I'm sorry, were you? I was going to say, in practice, we do find that we have more modern versions of the iPhone where you can't control the screen. Do they actually mark off themselves? I haven't, yeah. 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 I haven't, I haven't seen that. And I think partially, partially you just learn muscle memory, especially for something that's handheld of this is the effective range. Um, that's my, that's my sense. But also, um, I think a lot of the like voiceover, for example, doesn't use the edge in a significant way. Voiceover, you can all you can do from the center for almost anything. So that might just be, the, yeah, yeah. Andy, do you have a question? Yeah. So, so Chris Harris and that group has done some work with Tesla Touch. I know they had a Kai work in progress. Yeah, it was a really small, small, small set. I think it was a, it was either a Kai. It might have just been a Kai work in progress a year or two ago. I can send it to you. But I know they looked at that in particular. Um, beyond that. Beyond that, I don't. I mean, the, the other thing you see is coming from the more traditional accessibility community. These the tactile pin arrays. So you have these big, that big haptic displays that cost you know tens of thousands of dollars. And so there have been work with those too. But otherwise, in terms of the combination of kind of what you know other popular HDI tax, tactile feedback techniques and blind people, I haven't seen very many. Is there, is there a particular kind of feature that you're looking for in the? Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think. Right. Yeah. So I th I think the big thing is like making effective like region partitions. That's the big thing that I haven't seen 
Like Tesla Touch can do that in the sense of if you cross something, you feel it. But if there were a way that you could kind of more like more easily fo follow paths, I think just off the top of my head, I think that would make that would be really useful. Um, in terms of and what we really want to do is, since we have this big space, you know, if we have a big interaction space, how can we partition it in ways that are going to be useful and kind of really quick to get to, right? So if you can turn the the bigger touch screen into three or four distinct input areas that are easy to find, that seems like a big win for someone who's non-visual. Any other questions for Sean? Oh, Actually, I, I just, I'm curious about something. Okay. So those ATM machines that you kept showing, yeah. they do have mm -hmm. like an interface that I could, I've never tried to use one. Yeah. You know, you put your earphones, you plug it mm -hmm. in there, and I saw the little icon for mm -hmm. it on all those pictures. Mm -hmm. Is there any... Is there any comparison yet between like what's what's up with that? Is that is right. that not so useful? Mm -hmm. Is it something that people have trouble with? Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a that is a, a question that has a, many many answers. Um, yeah. So I mean I think so the ATM example. So in the U.S., most if not all ATMs are required to have an, a separate interface, and typically what that is is a headphone that you plug in and then buttons. Um, my understanding from talking to people is that they're very very slow. So basically, what it is is a scanning audio cursor. So they're not they're not ways to interact uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we've seen with gestures throughout is if you get them to work well, they can actually be really fast. Okay. Um, and that's a that's a, I think a big deal. Uh, the other piece is that the um, social perceptions are a big deal. So people want to have people want to have access to the things that everybody else has in the same way. I mean, this is something we hear again and again and again. That's like, oh, I want it to be. I don't want it to be designed for a blind person. I want it to be what they have. And part of that is pride. Part of that is just you know that's human nature. If we want to, we don't want to stick out. Um, so Kristen Shinohara has done some nice work looking at that in terms of how people respond to, or how someone with a disability perceives the people around them perceiving them, right? What their sense of, of how other people view them and how that affects their technology space. Well, I, I can see that in ATM machines, yeah. right? When I plug into that earphone, mm -hmm. I'm telling the people around me that I'm blind. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so here I am getting money out of the ATM machine. Yeah, yeah, Kristen, yeah, Kristen's got this great example in her, her Kai paper from 2011 mm -hmm. about someone, paranoid person who thinks that they're going to get, and it was like, it was in Seattle too, so it's like, yeah, it's not really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been a little bit overblown, but you know, it was like, right. oh, like I could get, I could get mugged, yeah. Or, but also I think just, yeah, having that so be visible. I'm, I'm wondering about it, sort of like your example between the, the different kinds of phone. I mean, if, but if people are, if that's something that I'm used to mm -hmm. and comfortable with, mm -hmm. then again, we're making a judgment like, oh, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use that. You should use access yeah. overlays. Um, so, you know, I wonder, like, as you, I mean, it's very difficult, but as you move forward with this work, like, how do you also accommodate mm -hmm. the folks who are like, I love Prologue to go, you know, 2.0, right? I mean, I, you know, I, yeah. I, I love what you're talking about, but I really feel comfortable with this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when, you know, yeah. I know where I am when I'm using this thing. Mm -hmm. So, so in terms of so, so as a as a researcher, well, I'll answer that first. Is uh, finding the geeks is a, is really important. So a lot of the work that we did that was more uh, l less conventional was with people who were t identified as being tech savvy and really wanted to try new things. And mm -hmm. they got the iPhone first when the iPhone first had the accessibility features, and they want to try things. And so, um, you know, there's a really big uh, blind tech community, uh, you know, with lots of blogs and podcasts and things where they review technology. And so. Uh, in terms of how to explore these these ideas and see whether they're any good, that's one way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like how the longer term picture of where that where the technology window is moving, that it, that's tricky, and and we get feedback about that too. I mean, the the early touchscreen stuff when we first started doing this, the slideroll project, we got feedback from people saying, "We don't want you to do this because uh, a touchscreen, an accessible touchscreen is always going to be in in a very real way." less accessible and less usable than a physical interface. And we're worried that if the people who make the touchscreens, if the ATM makers could get away with having some lousy touchscreen interface and say it was accessible, that they would lose that. Right. Um, so there is, some, there, is, there is some play there about kind of how the whole legal and uh, policy side of how these technologies are implemented and also where, uh, where you know, how products get developed, right? So um, I'd be interested to see, and I don't know offhand, how the explosion of the iPhone affects the companies, the small companies that are making the, the, the blind devices or making the customized things, right? So those kinds of things might get squeezed out. Mm -hmm. And then if you're, look, if you're relying on custom hardware, that's, that's, a real, that's a real bind to be in, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So 
I mean, I think, I think about this work as kind of demonstrating possibilities and say, oh, here's a, here's a way that we can take this device and use it in a way that we haven't before. Um, and w kind of put that out there. But I think these are real issues, and people, people do worry about them. I worry about them. Yeah. I was kind of curious about um, the gesture stuff you, you yeah. kind of touched on. Um, yeah, sure. uh, how much uh, have you looked at um, specific hand gestures? Was <laughs> gesture recognition you have mm -hmm. at the moment seems very 2D. Mm -hmm. um, but have you looked at the ways of recognizing certain hand gestures, for example, folding in uh, sign language into, into navigation and things like that? <laughs> So, so we haven't specifically looked at, at that, but I think that's a, you know, there is definitely re lots of research on 3D hand gesture recognition. Um, this worked partly as a kind of an evolutionary result with mostly using 2D image processing, and it worked well with the, the tasks we were trying to, uh, trying to accomplish. I think if we started it today, it would be much more, it, you know, 3D gestures would be more of a part of it. But in one thing about, one advantage is having gestures on a surface is it does provide some kind of at least passive tactile feedback. So if we have that, that's a useful advantage. But certainly it would be useful to have, uh, to have more op open air gestures could be useful. And so yeah. looking at so things like, less, less contact with yeah. the screen and more just near the screen, mm -hmm. proximity to the screen. Right, right. And I think that's, yeah, so that's also an, thinking about kind of how to give uh, more augmented feedback, to, you know, taking something that, that has really limited sensing capability and giving it additional sensing capabilities by proxy, that's a one, really thing, one thing to, to look at. Studies. Yeah, please do. My my email is is yeah, right there. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank thanks, you, everybody. John, and thank you all for.